Prepare to meet someone average who joined the ranks of hell and became below average. This is the story of Whistlebottom. Or is it the story of Fiend Grind? Or Nadine? Okay, I'll tell you. It's the story of how connected they were. We're all connected. Life Lab Notes Season 6, Episode 1, Whistlebottom, A Trespasser's Tale. And we will always have your back. Welcome to Life Lab Notes, where we review and compare our notes about life, what we have in common, what makes humans tick, and how we can keep from blowing up the lab. Whistlebottom, get in here. This tone of voice never preceded an upbeat meeting, where Whistlebottom was praised for his ingenuity, thanked for his tireless efforts, or complimented for his style in carrying out his assignments. And this tone of voice was all he ever got, even before he died. He breathed a heavy sigh, closed his book, and trudged toward his supervisor's door. Oh, now's a good time to let you know that this book was a very large and heavy book which held his records, the Ratiuncula, as it said on its cracked cover. At the front were the condensed details of his life on Earth, complete with audio and video highlights and turning points. The rest of those dusty yellowed pages were for tracking every awful afterlife job, from entry-level chores all the way to traveling to the upper world to create confusion, feed miscommunication, start fights, fan the flames, you know. Each demon carried their book with them at all times because assignments were assigned at all hours. But they don't really have hours. Basically, you're always on call. You might think the underworld would have some amazing way to keep track of these things, if they had to at all. And you'd be right. First of all, they do have to. That's the only way to ensure that the staff and citizenry are doing what they should be doing and that promotions are done in a fair and equitable fashion. You might also think demons don't do things in a fair and equitable fashion, but there you'd be wrong. Rules are rules, and you do not want your demonic underlings feeling cheated. No one wins. But back to the book. It's pretty amazing because no matter how many chapters of assignments statistics, punishments, and tracking info that's added to it, the number of pages always stays the same. It sort of gets deeper rather than longer, and it automatically translates to all human and non-human languages, so demons of other areas can cross-reference with you. Some demons use this feature for hookups, but that's not technically allowed. Whistlebottom's shaky hand closed around the icy doorknob of Mr. Kant's equally icy door. The knob turned his hand, this was normal, that's how it works, and Whistlebottom was transported into the darkened room. As soon as he entered, his book rose from his hand and hovered several feet above his head. It faced Mr. Kant's face, or where his face would be if he had a face. It opened with a crackle and a whoosh, and Mr. Kant, even without a face, sneered. What is this? Mr. Kant's flat voice landed with a thud, and his bony finger scraped across the page. Mr. Kant, first may I wish you a very pleasurable Masun Kaimadan, and may you- Shut it, Whistlebottom! Do you know how many in-person follow-up meetings I have to take before lunch today? No, of course you don't. You've been placed in Tempus Angustus, Level 3. Contact with fellow demons restricted to cleaning and medical staff. Yes, Mr. Kant. I'm running out of ways to penalize you. I do sometimes find my assignments challenging, sir. I can see that. Your current assignment, here... He poked a claw into the page, causing it to hiss and bubble. Is from two months ago. Two months. Have you been on vacation? 
tickled by his little jape, because the lower-class demons don't get vacations, and they never will, Mr. Kant laughed a dry, rumbly laugh. <laughs> like a death rattle. <clears throat> okay, I can't do it, but you can imagine it. I'm sorry, sir. It's the target. I, I'm afraid I knew her before I came here, and it seemed... I, I don't know, maybe like a conflict of interest? Mr. Kant looked at the book more closely. Nadine. You knew Nadine? Yes, sir. Let's see. With that, Mr. Kant flung his arm in an upward arc, like you might do when finding your warrior two stance. If you do yoga, you know. The book twisted and writhed, making a sort of dog-yelping, beetle-buzzing sound, and the image of Nadine appeared. With more gestures, Mr. Kant scrubbed quickly back and forth, landing on an image of Nadine and Whistlebottom in a happy selfie. This was before he was Whistlebottom, back when things had just started to look up, and he felt he had his whole earthly life ahead of him, but he actually only had about a week and a half. Whistlebottom was in love with Nadine, having met her in a pottery class in junior college. They hit it off right away as the only two students who created pottery that resembled ancient deities. Both claimed it was accidental. Whistlebottom watched as his book fast-forwarded through the highlights of their entire brief relationship, that magical quarter in class, meeting for coffee, watching movies, strolling on the pier, eating ice cream, chasing seagulls away from each other's hot dogs, stargazing. It was heaven. Mr. Kant read Whistlebottom's expression in the final image with deadly accuracy and spoke it with disgust. Heaven. Whistlebottom shifted uncomfortably. We have a problem, Whistlebottom. You. You have a problem. And you are a problem. You are a problem with a problem. Yes, sir. But if I may... The cleaning staff reports that you thank them. Uh, oh You put your own dishes away in the cafeteria. Well, uh, maybe. Fiendgrind says you hum. Yes. Whistlebottom sighed. I believe that's why he requested a new cellmate. Yes. Let's talk about your quarters. Your room has been feng shuied. The word slithered out from between Mr. Kant's sharp teeth in his non-face. It's just one. It was a very small sedum morganianum in the southeast corner, obviously, came Whistlebottom's hesitant reply. Don't be a donkey's ass, Whistlebottom. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's not what he said. But I wish it was, because the Sedum Morganianum succulent plant is commonly called a burrow's tail, and that would have been a great little meta joke. Eh, what he actually said was, Southeast corner be damned. A plant. Whistle bottom. Think about this. Think, won't you? Why don't you think? You have brought a living, vibrant thing into my domain, our domain. What do we say here? He pointed to a plank of rotted wood, suspended in the murky air and engulfed in eternal flame. Whistlebottom read the words aloud in a quivering voice. We are all connected. Others have to exist here too, you know. I'm sorry, Mr. Kant. Sorry doesn't bring in the dead. You have an unfinished task and an upcoming performance review. They will be looking for timeliness, efficiency, actually getting things done. Your performance reflects on my leadership. And, he pointed again at the fiery sign, this time with a boom of thunder that reminded Whistlebottom very much of the day he died. We are all connected. We're all connected, he murmured. So you had better say more than sorry, Whistlebottom. You'd better come back here and say you've finished your to-do list, and that you've finished Nadine. <laughs> in an instant, Whistlebottom was back in his room. He shook his head, shivered his whole body, then looked around at his bleak cell. The regulation gray walls of each demon's quarters 
were plastered with newspaper headlines from throughout human history, which were updated biweekly and included printouts of digital news. This is the interior design version of doom scrolling, surrounding the subjects with depressing subjects on a global scale keeps them overwhelmed and disheartened, which is exactly what you want in a demon. It's the best way to make them turn off their last remnants of empathy. Anyway, they're on a tiny shelf in the corner, with its cascade of tiny leaves down each stem was the aforementioned Burroughs tail. Whistlebottom pulled out the Cactus Makes Perfect plant marker from the dry soil in the Burroughs tail pot, and used the pointy end to carefully pick at the corner of a headline about indigenous people being killed for protecting their forest. From behind it, he gently pulled a piece of paper. He had gotten a C in that pottery class. He was not surprised by his grade because he knew he, A, was not artistic, and B, was distracted by his feelings for Nadine. C. Average, it said. Average. Whistlebottom said. He sat on the corner of his wooden cot and let the paper that so accurately summed up the whole of his existence slip from his hand. He began to cry. With a start, he hurried to the burrow's tail. Succulents don't need much water, and a little is all anyone there got. So Whistlebottom wiped a few tears from his cheeks and sort of scraped them into the pot on the inside of the rim. With the slightest brush of his teary finger, one of the leaves fell off, then another. Now, when Fiendgrind, his previous cellmate, had discovered Whistlebottom's plant, he reported it to the pasteurization department, which came in all officious and cruel, swept his room, and removed all traces of Whistlebottom's transgression. But in the struggle over the small bag of potting soil, the small spade, and the plant itself, a few leaves had fallen off, and Whistlebottom had secretly, deftly kicked them unnoticed under his cot. The thing about the sedum morganianum is that those leaves do fall off easily, but if you stick them in the ground, they'll grow roots. It had not been easy to smuggle in more earth soil from the realm of the living, but pilfering the coffee mug from Hell's Kitchen, not the one in Manhattan, the one down the corridor, that was easy. And so this little burrow's tail was the second plant, the second chance offered by a couple of broken, separated leaves. Meanwhile, where you live in the living world, Nadine was faced with a choice. Here, right in front of her, the unsweetened, bottled, major brand cold brew, or an iced oat milk chai latte that tastes like a cookie from the Deja Brew drive through across town. She looked at her watch. She thought of the time clock at work. The fellow behind her in line sighed really loudly. After a brief, heated exchange, that guy will never not regret. Nadine stormed through the glass door of the gas station, leaving the counter clerk to sweep up the broken bottle and sop the cold brew off of the guy. If she hit all green lights, she might just make it. Back in hell, Whistlebottom peeked out from behind the heavy iron door of his cell, glancing up and down the hallway. By his calculations, he had 24 hours to accomplish what was possibly impossible, which is probably why he had running in his head a mashup of the Mission Impossible theme and Brunhilde's funeral march from Act Three of Wagner's Gotterdammerung. This inner soundtrack was dramatic and unsettling enough to not technically violate Section XVII of the Code of Conduct, which basically covers enjoying things, anything pleasant, and he figured it would help muddle the mind-reading traps that hung everywhere, kind of like mechanical recording bats. He clutched his messenger bag to his chest, for a brief moment remembering the sensation of feeling his human heart pound. He concentrated on the music in his head as he made his way down the hall. Her heart pounding, Nadine threaded her way between a Nissan Sentra and a big rig as she raced to her goal. The adrenaline rush is one of the reasons she was such a careless driver. It's not that she didn't care about other people in other cars, or the property she occasionally damaged. 
an employees-only parking sign at work, her neighbor's fence. <sighs> there was a cat, too, once. It's just that whenever she was behind the wheel, everything blurred, just like the scenery she whooshed past. She would feel the rush of wind through her open car window, sing along to the radio, and finally skid haphazardly into half of a parking space of wherever she was going, usually with 60 seconds to spare. Absolutely thrilling. Whistlebottom trudged past the big grimy window of the intake office, where his passage into demonhood had begun. Just as before, he was about to turn both a literal and metaphorical corner. He shot a sideways glance in at the newbies in the info packet queue, some looking hard and tough, some bewildered. He knew they would stand there for several hours, for no logistical reason, that's just how it was done, awaiting their lanyards with their new demon names, a services pamphlet, outdated, of course, a map to the compound, inaccurate, of course, and their record book, of course. Later, in their own dim, stifling cells, they would review their whole earthly existence as recorded in those books, just as Whistlebottom had done, regretting some things, missing just about everything. Whistlebottom scrunched his eyes shut in a hopeless attempt to unsee the pages of his record book. The young boy who threw rocks against the trees as his father grieved by a big fancy wooden box. The sulking teenager who stole from the corner market. The arrogant young adult who lied to his friends. The time wasted on self-doubt. The opportunities for love and kindness lost. N no, not lost. Rejected. The opportunities rejected. Nothing egregious. All average. Then a boom, a tumble, a shriek, a roar like the sky splitting open, and in an instant, the portal, and the grim sign over its dark archway. How did it get so late so soon? Dr. Seuss. Fiendgrind spat on the ground. The resulting sticky, silvery splat pointed southeast, so that's where he headed. His mantra was, one step ahead, one giant leap for me. It didn't matter to him that it was a bastardization of the profound words spoken as the first human set foot on the moon. Fiendgrind was a bastard. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I should have warned you. A, a lot of people don't think that's a really offensive word, but some do, and if you do... I apologize. I should have said jerk. Fiendgrind was a jerk, known to say and do jerky things like flippantly mess up meaningful quotes and kill people. Currently, he was hard at work somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. Most demons are fine with their middle-of-the-road demon assignments. But for some, like Fiendgrind, inciting fear, clouding logic, creating chaos is not enough. After a while, it... It just gets too easy. A lot of humans do that stuff for themselves. He enjoyed getting his fellow demons in trouble. He was efficient and thorough, so he had taken it upon himself to follow Whistlebottom, determined to catch him failing at the Nadine assignment. Fiendgrind was also up for a performance review and was banking on his natural tracking skills and relentless hustle to trigger his promotion to Bounty Hunter. And so he found himself heading southeast to beat Whistlebottom to the offices of Homewood Realty, where Nadine worked. He would expose Whistlebottom as a complete failure at target striking. He would extinguish Nadine himself and bring them both back for their eternal disgrace and his own glory. Whistlebottom was, at that very moment, gathering supplies. Virtual gravitons, photons, gluons, and WNZ bosons, you know, to activate the four fundamental interactions. Gravitational, electromagnetic, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, blah, blah, blah. Without these, he would not be able to interact with the realm of the living, at least not on Earth. But you sure don't want to hear about gravitational time dilation. Suffice it to say, he had everything he needed for re-entry and to accomplish his goal. And, of course, he would check out a temporary trespasser's body to inhabit when he came through the portal. Oh, and almost an afterthought, 
a small vial of mercury vapor to make himself visible to the human eye. He placed these carefully in his messenger bag, closed it, and scanned his badge to exit the supply ward. Nadine was, at that very moment, breaking hard to avoid a slow-moving elderly shopper in the parking lot of the coffee drive through Why are you so slow? Oh, okay, you're old. Sorry, why are you so old? She honked, regretted it, then cursed under her breath. Those were words I know you'll find offensive, so I won't repeat them here. With a sudden burst of speed, Nadine executed a tight three-point turn, causing her iced oat milk chai latte to do an aerial, landing on the floor beneath her feet and popping its lid off. She grabbed the small ceramic figure that now swung wildly from her rearview mirror, and as she sped away from the nice little old lady she didn't hit with her car, its thin faux suede cord broke. She always divided her attention amongst all manner of tasks while driving. Nadine routinely put on mascara while changing lanes. She would eat salad, steering with her knees. She was, in fact, engaged in returning a very important text at the time of the accident. But for this, she pulled into a parking space and looked at the thing in her hand. Two soulful eyes, a long snout with wide nostrils and muscular shoulders, it had started out as a dog. Whistlebottom liked greyhounds. They have universal blood type for dogs, which he thought was cool. But, as previously mentioned, Whistlebottom was not artistic. And the greyhound's ears were too long, its shoulders too broad, and it started to look a lot like a bust of a minotaur. Half man, half bull, all monster. She had teased him about it. He threw it away. But she rescued it from the trash saying she needed a good luck charm for her car, even if it was... Mm, homely. If you can meet someone delightfully weird and cool who delights in your particular weirdness against all odds, and you can lose that person in an instant with no tag backs and no erases, what is the point? She asked herself. She needed way more than a good luck charm for her car. She needed one for her life. And she thought, she thought maybe she had found him in that ceramics class, in that guy who somehow made her want to be her best self, a self she hadn't met before him. Her eyes began to sting and water, and she heard herself gasp a single, sudden, sob-type gasp, she clutched the little talisman tightly, kissed him on the snout, then rolled down her car window. Whistlebottom was struggling to reorient himself to the light, having just re-entered the realm of the living. He popped a couple of virtual gravitons to steady the half-earthly, half-unearthly, all-wobbly state of his trespasser's body. He would need to clear his mind, calm his nerves, and overall, just really be on his game to find Nadine as quickly as possible. He didn't even know if his plan would work. Would she recognize his current weird kind of physical state? Could he explain his plan in a way that would make logical sense to someone in the realm of the living? Would she go with it? Leave the life she knew for an average human who became a below-average demon? At Homewood Realty, Fiendgrind lurked behind a giant oleander bush, scanning the parking lot and pretending to smoke. He required no acclimation time, no need to recalibrate his senses to the physical world, because he always checked out the same trespasser's body whenever he crossed back to the realm of the living, and he went over all the time. He could get in it, get over, and go. But the one thing he wished his hybrid state body could do was smoke. He flicked his oleander leaf cigarette onto the nearby asphalt and looked up just as Nadine's Toyota Corolla turned into the lot at about 50 miles per hour. It screeched to a stop in most of her parking space and she climbed out, juggling her tote bag, her keys, and the remainder of her iced oat milk latte with her pink hoodie dangling from between her tote bag and her elbow. Fiendgrind took a swig of mercury vapor and stepped forward. Yipes. Okay, you scared me. Sorry, homeless guy. I don't have any change. You're about to have some change. That is literally what he sounded like. His trespasser's body had the voice system of a cute cartoon character. 
And that line... He was going for the clever, punny kind of thing villains say in movies when they're about to kill someone. He always said something that he thought really fit in with his target's last words. But Fiendgrind had only ever said one statement right before terminating his target. So this was the first time he'd ever encountered a reaction. <laughs> what? Finish itinerous terminus. Nadine kept laughing. Terminus transitus. Be quiet. Oh, cool. I get it. I'm on camera. Uh, look, I'm really late. Here's where he could have said, Actually, you're just in time to meet your fate, or you're about to be the late Nadine Johnson. But instead, he just said, No, Nadine Johnson. I'm here to take your soul. For a nanosecond, Nadine thought, Maybe he's right, and maybe that's okay. Then, from across the parking lot... Stop! Whistlebottom glided toward them, entirely visible to Fiendgrind, entirely invisible to Nadine. Nadine was clearly pissed. All right, what the hell is going on? Nadine, it's me, Brian, from pottery class, from, from your life. Nadine stepped back, releasing everything from her arms. In slow motion, it seemed to her, her hoodie slipped to the ground, her tote bag threw up its contents, and her iced oat milk chai latte spilled for the second time. You can't see him, because he is in your mind, your imagination, Fiendgrind shrilled. No, I I'm really here. I just haven't taken the mercury vapor. It's somewhere in my messenger bag. I, I wasn't expecting to see you so soon. Plus, I stopped on the way to get some dirt for my cactus. Well, it's technically a succulent. I need to leave now because you're... Crazy. N no, no, me. I'm... I'm... I've lost it. With the quick thinking of someone who's had to hide and smuggle plants and gardening implements into hell, Whistlebottom swooped up Nadine's hoodie, draping it over his head. I think he was thinking... Oh, she'll be able to see where I am, but, of course, what she could see was her hoodie suspended in mid-air where Whistlebottom's voice was coming from. It just added another layer of dismay to her already overflowing basket of churning emotions. Holy, unholy, hehehe. <laughs> that was maybe Fiendgrind's finest moment, dialogue-wise. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Nadine, it really is me, I swear, but... You're dead. Y yes I am dead. So am I. Yes, so is he. I'm guessing, Fiendgrind, that you're here to kidnap her soul. More than that, Whistlebottom. I'll be taking you in, too, for miserably failing this assignment, among other things. The sun dipped behind a cloud that hadn't been there before, and the air grew hot and still. Fiendgrind spread his arms out and began a low, ominous hum. Nadine stood frozen, nervously side-eyeing her pink hoodie which floated next to her. Fiendgrind, don't. Just don't do this. If there's anything human left in you, please. Ha! It's the human in me that wants this. I'm going to be celebrated. I'm going to be promoted. I may get one of the fancy new cells with the unobstructed view of the River Styx. But that's your problem, Whistlebottom. You don't see what's all around you. Humans making a mess of everything. They're not all like that, Fiendgrind. Like your Nadine here? She's got a rap sheet as long as my arm. You're not allowed to see the records of someone who's not your target? You're not allowed to change the records. Whistlebottom anxiously scanned the parking lot, fully expecting to see the demon police there ready to pounce. I kept asking myself, why, except for the fact that he's a moron, can't Whistlebottom bring in this little lady? He sneered, spat, and went on. So I did a little digging and discovered your exploits. Your ex... ex... your... ah, damn it. Your privilege escalation was in the system that allowed you access to information resources that you then altered. Fiendgrind continued his slow, menacing circle around his captives as the sky further darkened, casting the world in a gray murk. The air crackled. 
You took the blame for the accident. Your two stupid souls were so closely intertwined that in the physical chaos of the car crash, Nadine's reckless driving was accredited to you. And when you were processed into demonhood, you lied to continue that falsehood. And then you hacked into the mainframe to make it official. Okay, okay, yes, yes, I did that. But I'm there now, I'm, I'm paying for it, it's done. W why is Nadine a target? Fiendgrind's lip twitched up into a sickening half-smile. Like I said, she's got a rap sheet as long as my arm. I know, because I wrote it all. Do you know what a Hitchcock zoom is? You've seen it. It's where they pull the camera back from the subject while zooming in the lens. The foreground gets bigger while the background kind of goes away. Very unsettling. Picture Whistlebottom. Well, he was still invisible, so picture that floating pink hoodie and let everything else, the crackling air, the darkening sky, Nadine standing there, and that sneering bastard, sorry, jerk, fiend grind. Let it all zoom back and away with the rasp of violins ascending in a shuddering glissando. That's right. I made it all up. You don't remember me, do you? No, I can see that. Maybe this will help. Potter's Wheel number five. With a gasp, Whistlebottom pictured the ceramics classroom, the shelves of tools and supplies, unfinished projects, the bags of clay and the stations where the students would work, throwing clay and doing their best to create earthenware art. Oh, <gasps> the uprising. Yes, or as I call it, the day you ruined everything. Whistlebottom glanced at Nadine, who shot a wide-eyed look back. Mr. Richter, they both exclaimed in unison, but there's no way I can do that myself. But they definitely said it at the same time. You couldn't have known that I was to be observed for my evaluation, because you were late. You and Nadine were always late, as per usual. Whistlebottom, fully visible to his fellow demon, carefully moved his hand into his messenger bag, trying not to move the flap more than he absolutely had to. There was a rumble of thunder, and Fiendgrind went on. You couldn't do the simplest task, even back then, Brian. To save time, you didn't properly wedge your clay on the wheel. I warned you about the air pockets in the clay. I urged you to start over as the peer evaluator looked on, judging me. I ordered you to add more water to your clay. You just stood there, frozen, like a frozen, frightened rabbit. And I told you. You and your clay would always be off-center. I'm sorry, Mr. Richter. I, I mean, f Fiendgrind, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry doesn't bring in the dead. Whistlebottom shut his eyes, and just like back then, he began to cry. But this time, using this temporary body, the trespasser's body he had checked out of the supplies and equipment department to come back to the realm of the living with the express purpose of saving Nadine. And here he was, crying painful tears out of tear ducts that had never been used before. Demons don't cry when they come back. They're on a mission of mayhem and destruction. Nadine had had enough. And just like back then... She spoke up. Mr. Richter, you... You were the worst teacher of all time. Keep quiet, girl. There are no other students here now to rally round you. There will be no chanting. Mr. Richter is a dictator. No marching around the arts department. No throwing of paint on me and my evaluator. And the only destruction of property today will be done by me. He brandished a fettling knife, the tool of choice for cutting clay and trimming rough edges. Not too sharp, but not exactly dull either, and yes, I am talking about both the knife and fiend grind. At the same moment, or maybe half a second after, in two swift moves, Whistlebottom whisked out of his messenger bag the vial of gauge boson particles, and Nadine snatched from the ground at her feet her car keys. Whistlebottom looked at her. What's that gonna do? 
I don't know yet, but I want to be ready when I find out. With a crack of thunder and a blinding bolt of lightning, Fiendgrind lifted his arms and rose in the air, chanting ominous-sounding Latin and spitting. Of course, Whistlebottom knew what was happening. He had uttered those very words himself when collecting targets. But when he did it, it was without the drama and the spitting. Sometimes he just said it in English. But this was it. It was go time. He zipped up the pink hoodie and swooshed up and around Fiendgrind, leaving a contrail of chalky white. Whistlebottom hurled an entire vial of elementary particles at Fiendgrind. It cracked open on his belt buckle, releasing its contents, and Fiendgrind winced. The vial hit the pavement at Nadine's feet, creating a dark glow in the cement. Everything seemed to shudder and groan as unexplainable forces of both this world and the next fought for dominance. Down below, Nadine struggled to hold her ground, her hair whipping around her face in the powerful wind. She looked up at the battle of visible demon versus pink hoodie and shouted something unintelligible in the din. The two demons turned to her at once, but it was Fiendgrind who made the first move. With a sneer, he surged toward her. The sheer force of his approach sent her flying backwards into the oleander bush. With a roar, Whistlebottom flew at Fiendgrind. They tumbled in mid-air, sending out sparks as they smashed the employees-only parking sign previously dinged by Nadine and a couple of nearby cars. They thudded up against the vending machine under the stairs, and for a moment, Whistlebottom had the upper hand. His invisible hand was closed around Fiendgrind's throat. Fiendgrind spat into the face of his opponent, and the mercury in his system was just enough to cause Whistlebottom's face to become visible, the effect spreading slowly over his whole trespasser's body. Thanks. That saves me some mercury vapor. Now let us go, Fiendgrind. And return to the underworld a big loser like you? Never. Besides... You know the effect will wear off, and you only brought one dose of mercury with you. You can't go back and get more. What are you going to do? Save it for Christmas? Do you think your girlfriend's going to want to hang out with you when you're invisible again? Ha <laughs> ha! You're going to fade away, trapped in a weak, invisible trespasser's body, left to roam the land of the living like some kind of ghost or something. Whistlebottom headbutted Fiendgrind, immediately regretting it. Gah! Why do people do that? Fiendgrind, unfazed, saw his chance and took Whistlebottom down with a classic Koshiguruma judo throw. Whistlebottom struggled to get up, still reeling from the headbutt. Fiendgrind, the stronger of the two, put his foot on Whistlebottom's chest. Nadine, he's right. Fiendgrind will be back. I can't ask you to stay with me. And I don't know if I can help you hide from your fate. That's right. I have both of you guys' fate. And also your sweet asses in my hands. Inappropriate, Mr. Richter. Nadine bent down and picked up the broken vial. As I've mentioned, she liked taking risks. Yow! The shock that ran through her arm caused her to drop the vial from her left hand and tighten her grasp on her key fob in her right, inadvertently pressing the panic button on it and adding her car alarm to the maelstrom. Fiendgrind writhed, releasing his hold on Whistlebottom. That's it, Whistlebottom called out. The radio waves from your key fob can cause interference with the waveforms of everything around us. That doesn't make sense, Fiendgrind blurted. Nothing makes sense, Fiendgrind. With renewed energy and resolve, Whistlebottom began a dizzying attack, hurling more energy particles, climbing, diving, and barrel rolling like an F-104 starfighter pilot. These half-world, vaguely human disguises we use here, the, the power they give us for the purpose of destruction, making everything worse on both sides. You and me, Fiendgrind, we don't make sense. Fool to not use the power. You'll never reach my level of brilliance. Your ego is just as out of control as it ever was, Fiendgrind. And so is my love for Nadine. I love you, Brian! Nadine stood proudly, shouting at the sky and firing her key fob at Fiendgrind as he attempted to dodge radio waves, quantum particles, and the power of love. 
Nadine and Whistlebottom concentrated their beams at the center of his chest until finally, with a deafening roar, he burst apart into smoldering shards that wafted to the ground and sizzled. Nadine, is that your car alarm? A voice called out from a second floor office door. Yeah, Judy, sorry. She whoop whooped her alarm off and turned to Whistlebottom. They hugged, which stung them both a bit, but was worth it. Six months later, bing, the door chimed as they entered the gas station convenience store. The woman looked around, signaled the all clear to her hoodied companion, then went straight to the counter. Twenty on number five. The cashier took her money and gestured to the mysterious figure, now reaching into a refrigerated case. He with you? She shot a glance over her shoulder. Yeah, that's my dude. The clerk leaned over the counter and lowered his voice. You really okay? I can call the cops if you want. You heard the lady. I'm her dude. The man in the hoodie set a bottle of unsweetened major brand cold brew and a Powerade on the counter and pulled his hood back. The clerk's eyes widened. The hell? Nadine cocked an eyebrow. Now that's just insensitive. You know how in movies the bad guys fight and trash the place and then make an exciting getaway? Sometimes the good guys have to. Whistlebottom and Nadine stormed through the glass doors of the gas station, followed by the clerk who hastily conjured a lightning bolt and launched it at them. Whistlebottom ducked and swerved, dropping the bottle of cold brew. Oh, sorry. I should have kept my hood on. You never learn, WB. I'll drive. Whistlebottom, A Trespasser's Tale, was written and performed by Sylvie Zamora, based on a true story. <laughs> no, definitely not. Based on her imagination. My imagination. I'm Sylvie. Battle March by Phil Ward. For more Halloween delights, cross over to lifelabnotes.com, where you can make contact with our series, 13 Days of Halloween, and another 13-day series, Invisible. Sense our presence on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and of course, share this episode with your loved ones. Thanks for listening. <laughs>